All right, it is time for another recording and another Blackboard Collaborate session. We are now officially on Chapter 21. And per our schedule, we have two weeks to go through Chapter 21. But we're going to go through a large portion of it today. So the goal will be that next week we could maybe review and tie up some loose ends and, uh, and finish up and get prepared for asking any questions that we have for before our test over chapters 19 through 21. All right, so chapter 21 is going to tie into a lot of what we've already talked about in terms of cardiac output and how to get blood back into the heart to increase end diastolic volume, and then how to get blood out of the heart by increasing or altering um, afterload through resistance. And blood pressure and the pressures that the heart, the ventricular systolic pressures have to be is going to be an influence of what the physiology of the blood vessels are doing and their um, state of constriction or dilation. So arteries are going to carry blood away from the heart. Um, they're going to enter peripheral tissues. They're going to branch. And they are going to decrease in their diameter as they move away from the heart. But because their numbers are going to increase, we're going to see that their increase in total surface area uh, interaction of cell blood interface. Some of your smaller arterial branches are known as arterioles. And we're going to find that arterioles are important because they are going to be the control points of much of your vascular resistance and much of the flow of blood into capillary beds um, in large amounts or trickling into capillary beds in smaller amounts. The capillaries are where the diffusion process takes place, and it's diffusion between the blood and the interstitial extracellular fluid. And then there's a second tier of diffusion that's occurring from the interstitial fluid and the inside of the cell. But the capillaries are constantly bringing new numbers of oxygen and glucose and amino acids to the interstitial environment. So those things can then diffuse into that interstitial environment. And then based on gradients and availability of channels, can then potentially move into the cell. And conversely, as the cell is removing and getting rid of waste, they're going into the interstitial fluid. And some of that waste will then be picked up by the bloodstream in the capillaries. So the key of the capillaries is we need really small layers of tissue to afford diffusion processes to not be impeded by a thick wall that the, the items would have to diffuse through. The second big thing about capillaries is we need the flow of the fluid to be very, very slow. So we need the velocity at which the fluid is flowing through the capillaries to come to a slow level, slow amount, to better maximize the ability of our um, products, of our molecules, to diffuse in and out. Now, eventually, capillaries are going to start to collect. And we're going to collect them into venules. Venules are going to be small veins. And then venules are going to start to form a tree branch into larger vessels that we're just going to know as veins. Okay. So the pulmonary side, we call them pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins. Uh, we see that the diameter and the, and the distribution and the distance of the pulmonary vessels moving through the system are less than what the systemic. But they still are carrying the same amount of flow, the same amount of cardiac output. They're just not carrying it to exactly the same height with distance that the systemic system will do that. Okay. All right, your vital functions of your cells, they being able to maintain life, they being able to maintain chemical processes and exchange, are all going to depend on the blood capillary cell capillary interactions. So cells rely on the capillary diffusion to obtain nutrients and oxygen. And they rely on the capillary diffusion to take away all of their waste products so that way they can be removed out of the system. Okay. 
So there are lots of homeostatic mechanisms that operate within the cells talking to the capillaries, cells talking to the arterioles, cells maybe even influencing even higher up the branch all the way to some bigger arteries that will adjust uh, blood flow into the capillary bed to meet their demands. And so some of that autonomic control is very important in helping us distribute blood to different areas at different stages of activity and um, oxygen consumption. All right. The blood vessels thus are constantly having to change, and so they have to be very resilient. They have to be able to be flexible when pressure increases. They have to be changing in their shape to accommodate down to the capillary level, a small amount of distance to overcome. Uh, and they have to be able to handle, as they change their shape, the flow velocity of the blood in different areas is going to be different. And the flow dynamics, so the, the flow patterns of whether it's laminar or turbulent flow is going to be changing. Okay? So because of that, all of our vessels are not exactly the same. And we do have some very different distinctive anatomical features associated with arteries versus uh, veins. Now, our big vessels are all going to characteristically have three distinctive layers. The innermost layer is going to be our tunica intima layer, also known as tunica interna. So tunica tells you layer, intima tells you it's the innermost. Okay. We know that this layer is going to be the one where the blood is flowing by, touching, and interacting with. So because we know fluids are flowing and it's going to be uh, subject to stresses related to fluid dynamics, to turbulent, and then laminar flow, and shear stress, this layer has to have, at its innermost depths, an endothelial lining, some type of simple squamous epithelium, cells touching each other, cells making a barrier that protect underlying tissue from the forces that the fluid moving through the tube are going to exert. Right? Now, all simple squamous, all of your epithelial layers tend to be housed by a basement membrane, and that basement membrane is going to be our um, lamina propriae and our connective tissue part of the tunica intima. On the arterial side, and what you're seeing in the picture over here on the arterial side, is in the inner margins, there's going to be a very large amount of elastin fibers, elastic proteins, that really allow for a very big stretching ability of the vessel when pressure gets high and a lot of fluid is moving into the tube. And that internal elastic membrane is critical in allowing the tunica intima to have a little bit extra recoil ability. Okay. So one of the difference, tunica intima, both veins and arteries have the simple squamous epithelium, the endothelium. And you're going to see that throughout the entire network, down to arterioles, down all the way to capillaries. There is always going to be some connective tissue. Even in the capillaries, while it's basically endothelium, there is still a very thin, small amount of connective tissue behind it. Where we differ is the connective tissue characteristics and properties. In our arteries, especially our large arteries, we have the presence of this internal elastic membrane. All right, the second layer is going to be our tunica media layer. All right, it's the middle layer. It is going to contain large sheets of arranged smooth muscles, cells. And these cells are going to be framed in a loose connective tissue. So there are going to be potential blood vessels in here. There's going to be some connective tissue. So fibroblasts, there will maybe be white blood cells, and a lot of collagen and elastin fibers. Collagen fibers bind the tunica media to the tunica intima and to the tunica externa. And then the tunica uh, or the elastin fibers are going to, in the artery side, allow for that elasticity again so the vessel can be dilated and then constricted down. Okay. Now, again, in the 
arterial side at our medial bor or our border between the me tunica median and the tunica externa, we're going to see another very rich area of elastic fibers. And this is going to be called our external elastic membrane. And so here we're going to see the smooth muscle cells encircled in some uh, additional elastic fibers. We're going to see that this is going to help when the vessel needs to increase its diameter and when the vessel needs to contract and um, decrease the diameter or when it's relaxing and increasing the diameter. Okay. All right. The third and, and this internal or sorry, external internal elastic membrane is again not present in some of our big veins. What we'll also see with the tunica medial layer is the smooth muscle cells are going to have the ability to um, hypertrophy, hyperplasia, depending upon the force being exerted on them. And so what we see is the layer is more widthwise robust in our arteries than it is in our veins, and that comes from the amount of force and pressure being exerted by blood, by the velocity, by the fluid dynamics, and because it's greater in the arteries, we see the more robust muscle layer. Okay. The other thing we're going to notice as we go through different layers is on the vein side, when they have to shed a layer, they shed this smooth muscle layer, this tunica media layer. And when you see the, um, the arterial side, there is always some muscle present until you get to the capillaries. And that muscle is important because it plays a role in the distribution of blood. And so always having a few layerings or a few um, rounds of smooth muscle wrapped around the vessel is critical in being able to constantly manipulate that vessel to let less or more blood into the downstream tissues. The outermost layer is the tunica externa. The tunica externa is also sometimes known as the tunica adventitia. So you can use either of those terms interchangeably. And if you need to spell adventitia, it's on page 725 of the new book. All right. So this is going to be connective tissue. And we know there's going to be lots of collagen fibers scattered with some elastin. But the collagen is important because, remember, these arteries and veins actually sit next to each other. So if you were to open up a rat and you look at the femoral artery, right next to it is the femoral vein, and right next to it is also the nerve, the, fem uh, the fem femoral nerve. If we look and if we were to pull out of our um, models and our tissues all of our abdominal areas and we look at just how the um, inferior vena cava and the abdominal descending aorta sit, they're sitting right next to each other. And so these tunica externa and these collagen layers are what anchor the vessel into their spot, so therefore they're not moving around and they don't migrate into the muscle or into the dermis of the skin. They can stay in that hypodermis layer and then they can stay anchored to each other and kind of continue to utilize the same pathways to and from downstream tissues. Right? Now, in the arteries, we're going to see more elastin fibers here because, again, the arteries are going to need that elastic fiber, that elastic protein for give and go, for recoilability. In the veins, you're going to see something different than from arteries. You're actually going to see presence of smooth muscle cells. And that smooth muscle cell has the ability in some ways to compensate later on uh, when we lack medial medial layers and large numbers of smooth muscle cells, okay? So again, connective tissue fibers in this layer uh, blend in with adjacent tissue and their connective tissue fibers out, outer parts. They stabilize and anchor those blood vessels, okay? Now, one of the concepts is if you look at the vessel wall, there are a lot of cells in here. I mean, just look at all of this. All right, so one of the things that has to happen is you're actually going to see blood vessels that come in and then have capillary beds into the different layers of the cell. And these special blood vessels that are not coming off of blood here in the center, but actually coming off of other smaller vessels out and around these big vessels, they are known as the vasa vasorium. And so it means vessels of vessels. And their purpose is to bring blood so these smooth muscle cells, these endothelial cells can get oxygen, and they can get glucose, and they can get amino acids, and they can sustain life because they can't take 
the oxygen and the amino acids and everything um, from the blood flowing through this big interior of the vessel because the interior of the vessel, that blood is moving at too fast a velocity and there's too much force and there's just too many other factors that would prevent the perfect ideal diffusion capability. So that is why you have vessels that come in and then you have capillary beds that are established in the lining. Right. Uh, another big takeaway here is, again, the differences between arteries and veins. So big picture, arteries, especially in the systemic system, are going to have larger, thicker walls because they have more tissue and cells within each of the three layers. And they're going to see more elastic fibers and more layers in the medial of smooth muscle. The vein is going to be a little thinner. Okay. The lumen. Um, for each, it's going to be a little different. You see the, the intima here is kind of smooth in the vein, whereas in the arteries, there's those hills and valleys, right? So in a cross-sectional view, the lumen of the artery actually looks smaller than the corresponding lumen of the vein, right? And again, because the walls of the arteries are relatively thick and strong, they keep their circular shape when sectioned. So as you see here, they keep a circular shape, whereas the veins are going to be distended and maneuvered a little bit because they're not as robust in their walls. And so they may flatten or dis or kind of flatten out when you cut them. And that's what this picture here is showing, okay, the lumen, right? The lining, again, the endothelial lining of an artery cannot contract. So when the artery constricts, its endothelium becomes folded, and the sectional arteries have a pleated appearance. That's going back over here, that pleated appearance, right? On the veins, you don't have that, okay? So thicker walls, arteries are, so arteries are thicker walls, arteries have more of a cylindrical or circular shape, whereas veins won't in cross-section. Arteries are going to be more resilient, more um, elastin fibers. They're not going to have as much distortion or collapse, collapsing and tearing. And the veins, what we'll learn, is are going to have pieces and parts of their endothelium start to come into the vessel, and they're going to form valves. And those valves are going to be important uh, when we talk about getting blood back to the heart. Arteries are going to constrict when told by certain processes and certain chemicals and certain um, different um, triggers. And constriction means that the state of the smooth muscle cells are going to increase in their actin-myosin interactions. There will be more calcium calmodulin, and the vessel diameter will de decrease. The resistance to flow is going to increase in vasoconstriction, and we're going to learn that the pressure with the smaller tubing is going to change more significantly with that increase in resistance, right? The, but when we have the muscles get triggered to relax, such as exposure to nitric oxide and some of these other drugs, we're going to see the diameter of the lumen increase, and that's called vasodilation, okay? Now, the arteries, when they change their diameter, whether through vasoconstriction or vasodilation, that is going to have an effect on afterload of the heart. So whether or not arteries are in a state of constriction or dilation is going to affect the ESV, the end systolic volume, the force that the ventricles have to overcome and therefore how much fluid is left in the ventricle at the end of systole. And so vasoconstriction is going to increase afterload of the heart, causing more ESV to stay behind and stay in the heart. Vasodilation is going to decrease afterload, and that's going to let the ESV be less than what it would normally be, and so there'll be less fluid left in the heart. Okay? Vasoconstriction and vasodilation are going to affect the peripheral blood pressure. So not the blood pressure of necessarily, um, at this point, systemic, systole, diastole, you know, what the ventricles reach, but the peripheral blood pressure, right? Uh, what's the pressure flowing at any given time in any given segment of the vessel, right? And 
the constriction and dilation is going to affect capillary blood flow. How much blood gets to go to the kidneys? How much blood gets to go to the brain? How much blood gets to go to the skeletal muscle? And we manipulate that vasoconstriction, vasodilation to take our five liters or our seven liters of cardiac output a minute and distribute it to where the cells that need it the most get it at that given time and cells that might not be needing it efficiently and effectively at that given moment will get less blood uh, until we can redistribute again and get them more blood later on or recruit more blood through other cardio uh, output increasing mechanisms. All right. So when we divide the arteries and veins into categories, one of the ways we divide them is we actually look at their size and physiology related to the vessel walls and the types of proteins and um, tissues present. Right? And so our elastic arteries are also known as our conducting arteries. These are going to be all the really big arteries that carry large volumes of blood away from the heart. And they have large diameters. And they're going to see um, very few numbers of them. So they don't necessarily collectively put together a big cross-sectional area. So our velocity of blood flowing through them is going to be very high. So some of the examples of our elastic arteries include the pulmonary arteries, the common carotids, the subclavians that are underneath the um, clavicles heading to the arms, and the common iliac as well as your aorta and all the major branches of the aorta. Okay. All right, so these vessels, per their name, have to be very resilient, have to have a lot of recoil. So we are going to see high amounts of elastic fibers. So we're going to see an internal elastic membrane. We're going to see an external elastic membrane. We're going to see some smooth muscle cells, but not a huge amount. So it's not the most robust amount of smooth muscle. All right? And we're going to see a lot of tolerance to pressure changes because they are going to see the highest pressure changes and they're going to see the drop of the blood um, pressure from the heart and so they're going to see kind of like the pulse pressure, the differences between a, a heart in full contraction versus a heart in um, diastole and relaxation. Right? Now, during ventricular, ventricle systole, the pressure will rise rapidly and the elastic arteries expand as the stroke volume is ejected. During the ventricular diastole, the blood pressure within these um, vessels are going to fall. And we're going to see a little bit of that er elastic recoil back to original dimensions. Okay. Um, so that's basically it. So they're going to see pressure preaks, they're going to see valleys, they're going to see blood reaching the arterioles, and they're going to see fluctuations, and they're going to see blood flow pretty continuous. All right, our muscular arteries are going to be most of the arteries bringing blood and distributing it to the different skeletal muscle mat groups, so like your quadricep muscles, your hamstrings, your triceps, your biceps, and then all your internal organs. So this will be your renal artery, your uh, hepatic artery, your radial, your ulna, you know, those big major arteries, but not the really big ones because they're not getting the almost the whole amount of stroke volume. Right? Now these muscles have or these cells have to have a lot of muscle because they need to constantly um, manipulate and change the lumen diameter uh, to accommodate again the changes in blood flow that need to occur to the downstream tissues. Okay? So you're gonna see um, like the femoral arteries of the thigh are examples of muscular arteries. And then we're going to see that many of these muscular arteries uh, play a role in pressure points. And so we can place um, pressure on them and decrease and reduce blood flow to control bleeding downstream of them. Okay. All right, eventually, as you can see, we need to shed to get down to capillaries, to get down to just the tunica intima layer. And so there's a change from the muscular arteries to our arterioles. And our arterioles are going to have a very small diameter, but they are going to be, we're going to have gone from the aorta, which is one vessel, and most of our big elastic arteries, you know, there are five or six or seven, to about 160 muscular arteries. And now we're going to increase that again a few fold to, thousands, you know, of arterioles, okay? So the tunica media is still present, but we're down to maybe one to two complete layers of smooth muscle cells around the um, tunica intima, right? And the tunica intima is even decreased a little bit more um, to where it's endothelium and just a little bit of connective tissue between, okay? Now, this 
these are, these arterioles, the smooth muscle cells will be responsive to, you know, the, the chemical factors and molecules released from the cells below it. So if the cells below are not make, getting enough oxygen and they start having to make ADP and ADP into a, um, an ATP and an AMP and then they have to take ADP and AMP and make an ATP and an adenosine, they might start releasing some of these AMP and adenosines and that it would be a trigger that the tissue is not getting enough oxygen because now they're making ATP and breaking down it to its most basic levels to keep some ATP available. All right, so they're going to be responding to local factors from the downstream tissue. They're going to know when the oxygen levels are low and they're going to try to dilate and bring more blood supply to those downstream vessels if they can. Okay. Uh, they are going to constrict with many cases with sympathetic stimulation depending again on the vessel. So some of our skeletal muscles will actually dilate because they have a different sympathetic uh, receptor. But others are going to constrict and that means that when we need to run away or fight, we're not going to send massive amounts of blood to the kidneys, to the GI tract, to the large intestine, small intestine, to the stomach. So that's why sometimes people who eat too much have just De, um, distress in their belly and their GI tract when they're exercising because there's not enough blood supply to go to those cells and there starts to be discomfort because the food's not moving through the system like it should and things aren't being absorbed. And where's that blood then going? It's going to the skeletal muscle which needs the excess um, blood supply to be able to grab as much oxygen and glucose to maintain ATP, to maintain being able to continue to constrict and produce movement, okay? So when we talk about pressure, especially blood pressure and afterload, in many cases, the pressure is coming from these vessels constantly changing their constricted and their dilating states. And so all of our, you know, force of opposition to blood flow in downstream tissues, known as our resistance, is really coming from the arterioles, okay? Um, Let's see, what else do I want to talk about? So the arterioles, um, so our arteries carry blood under great pressure and their walls adapt. Again, sometimes local artery pressure can exceed the capacity of the elastic component, so it would overstretch and that would lead to an aneurysm. So one of the pathological things that can happen is if in those elastic arteries especially, your pressure causes so much stretch, they can make like basically bulges in them and that would be the aneurysm and the threat is aneurysms, if the elastic tissue continues to be stretched and, and weakened and torn into, it can burst and cause bleeding, really bad bleeding um, into your spaces and then blood's not getting to downstream tissue. Okay, so the aorta is really at risk for that and that will kill you in seconds to minutes. All right, capillaries. Capillaries are going to be at the simplest level, our most abundant vessels with the thinnest walls. And the thinnest walls meaning they are simple squamous epithelium with um, a little bit of lamina propria connective tissue that kind of anchors the capillaries into the interstitial fluid around them, okay? Uh, they are the only vessels that should allow permanent or permit exchange of oxygen and gases and amino acids and salts and and hormones and even the white blood cells if they stick and roll to be able to come into and out of the bloodstream. Okay? And they have to have to collectively, they have to have a very large amount of surface area that they cover so we can get the slowest blood velocity through the system and therefore give our cells the ability to grab and diffuse what they need in and remove and release what they need out, okay? The average diameter of a capillary is just big enough to let a single red blood cell through at a time. Now we have two populations. Continuous capillaries mean the endothelium is a complete lining. So there are, if there's any gaps between the membranes, it's very small. And there's no pores or big holes in these capillaries. And if there are, clotting processes should come into play to plug them up. All right. So continuous capillaries are located like everywhere. They're the majority of the capillaries that feed blood to cells in epithelia and cartilage. Okay. And their goal, again, is to allow things to move in and out, but only the very small things and a little bit of water. Right. 
So because some things are going to leak out like water and we are going to see oxygen and salts and glucose and fats, and because some of the osmolarity is going to change of what the concentration of solutes in the inside the blood versus what's going to become outside the blood, we are going to see a net loss of a little bit of plasma as we flow through capillary beds. And so because of that, that's why the whole lymphatic system is, is in place. And, um, and so if we were to say, okay, in a capillary bed, we're starting with 5 milliliters. At the end of the capillary bed, you might only have 4.8 millimeters of fluid. So it just means some of it is being lost. And those factors of how much, whether you lose more or less, is going to come back to osmosis and blood pressure and uh, solute concentration. And that's where albumin comes into play. Okay. Now our fenestrated capillaries are going to be more uh, porous. There's going to be more big holes. So we're going to see more rapid exchange of water and solutes because they can diffuse a little bit easier into and out of the blood. And you're going to see that uh, they even allow bigger things in and out of the blood, not necessarily the blood cells. So the red blood cells and the, plas and the albumin shouldn't. But you might see more of the hormones, especially like signaling hormones, because um, you see this in the pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus to the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus is making these releasing or inhibiting hormones, they would then have easier ability to get into the pituitary gland. Okay. Now, some special things to talk about. Continuous capillaries in the brain. There is a second layer of cells wrapped around the, um, the, the, the capillary. And those cells are those astrocytes. And recall the astrocytes are just another tier of tissue to make the capillaries less leaky and less likely to release inappropriate things into the neurosystem area so that could potentially damage, harm, and kill neurons. So that's how you get your blood-brain barrier. And fenestrated capillaries. In different books, you'll see that it's a separate category, but our book here talks about sinusoidal capillaries as a type of fenestrated capillary. Uh, so these are capillaries that are even sinusoidal, that are even more flattened, more irregular, more robust. And what they basically do in the liver and the kidney is, and the spleen is they're more about letting kind of blood um, pool in an area around a lot of large populations of white blood cells so that way we can have more free exchange and the ability of some of our macrophages to interact with the blood cells themselves and remove them out of circulation. Okay. All right. So I think I've hit most of this. Arteries, they vasoconstrict, they dilate, they, by constricting and dilating, they can affect afterload. So how much ESV is allowed to remain or not remain in the ventricle. They will affect the pr blood pressure of the system. And they will affect flow to downstream tissues, capillary flow by letting more blood into an organ or less blood into an organ. And we talked about our three layers, our three types. Again, capillaries, we have the two types, continuous and fenestrated. You get down to no tunica media, really no tunica externa, just a little bit of basal lamina, except in the brain. The brain will then have another layer around these capillaries of astrocytes that are going to make a second kind of epithelial lining kind of mist to the capillaries and re 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 prevent some of the molecules, proteins, amino acids, or some small things from exiting the blood into the extracellular environment around neurons, so a little more protection. All right, capillary beds. So when we talk about capillaries, yes, we have a large number of them. But in many cases, capillary beds um, are a network of interconnected vessels, and in any point in time, um, the blood flowing through them is not sufficient enough to fill every single vessel. And so each capillary bed usually has at least one or two controlling um, arterioles that give rise to a certain amount of blood to enter the capillary network. And then depending on how much blood that is, there will be some of the um, collateral capillaries or like cross-linking capillaries that we're not going to let blood into in a normal situation because the cells don't need that much oxygen and that much glucose and that much fuel. So you're going to see these little pre-capillary sphincters guard entrances into some of the capillary channels. And the goal is to just, if there's only a little bit of blood coming through, the, the blood just flows through the major capillary, um, capillary like, uh, what do you call them? 
capillary thoroughfare channels. And then if the cells start needing more blood and they start sending communication to the arterial to dilate, then those arterioles will dilate and let more blood into the capillary bed. And then more blood into the capillary bed will be more blood to enter the capillary thoroughfares as well as some of the additional vessels um, because the precapillary sphincters will dilate. Okay. All right, so the precapillary sphincters in some ways help us keep blood flowing through the capillaries in the major channels. It helps keep potentially like if you had your, your triceps, um, your tricep muscle or your bicep muscle. It keeps the blood kind of evenly distributed to a little bit in all the capillary beds and not just all the capillary beds like on the outer part of the muscle or on the superior part of the muscle. Right? But then when this muscle needs more blood, you have an ability to open more lanes of traffic and, and, and bring more blood flow in, but continue to keep the blood flowing through the capillaries um, with more cross-sectional area so the velocity can stay low. Okay? All right. Um, if something happens and one artery is blocked, occluded, or damaged, you have other arteries that can still supply blood to a capillary bed. And you see that up here because the arterial might be linked to maybe both the radial and the ulna vessels. And so if, let's say, you end up with a blockage of one of those vessels, the collateral might be able to help us. Okay. And again, the fusion of two collateral arteries to supply a capillary bed is an example of an arterial ana uh, anastomosis, right? the joining of blood vessels. Okay. All right. Um, vessels are going to be subject to growth. So in many cases, let's say your capillary bed to your hamstring muscles isn't really sufficient because you continue to stress your hamstrings to need more oxygen, to need more power output, to need more force production. And so one of the good things about our vessels is we can grow new vessels. And that process is known as angiogenesis. And angiogenesis is a function of a lot of different growth factors, but one of the very well characterized and studied is a, a group of growth factors known as vascular endothelial growth factors. So they abbreviate it VEG, V-E-G-F. And so when we look at growing capillaries, we want to see that the um, cells around the area that they want to grow new capillaries, new collaterals, new vessels are going to start secreting VEGF, vascular endothelial growth factor, and that's going to start to cause potentially some new branching and therefore new vessels to develop off of the existing vessels. And so one of the things about VEGF is we, in, um, in basically in ischemic diseases like heart disease and some of our peripheral ischemic vascular diseases, we want to understand how to get cells to make VEGF. And we want to understand how to get the cells to grow new capillary beds, let's say because there's been atherosclerosis, damage, blockage, occlusion of maybe one of the major vessels into that organ. Cancerous people want to do the complete opposite. One of the things that happens in tumors is cancer cells will start to secrete VEGF and start to grow their own capillaries and their own blood vessels to the tumor site. And then they start stealing the nutrients in the blood and the oxygen in the blood for their cellular growth, which is inappropriate. And it's taking away from blood flow and nutrients to healthy, normal tissue. So cancer people want to turn off VEGF and starve your tumors, and then ischemic disease people want to turn on VEGF and grow new capillaries to recover and reperfuse um, tissue that might be hypoxic or lacking a sufficient amount of oxygen. Okay, so that's some of the interesting tidbits about capillary beds, and depending upon which pathological condition you study, you might take one side of the, um, the process to study how to make it happen or how to stop it from happening. All right, so veins. Veins, we're going to see, bring um, blood back to the heart. And they have to overcome a few issues. One thing they have to overcome is there's not a lot of high pressure in veins. How does most things move in the body? They move from the area of high pressure to the area of low pressure. All right, the right atria does help a little bit because when the right atria has no blood in it, 
the pressure in the right atria is somewhere around zero millimeters of mercury in pressure. So as long as the veins have a little bit of pressure, whether that's two millimeters, 10 millimeters, 15 millimeters, depending upon other factors, right, there is a little bit of a gradient to somewhat help get blood back into the right atria. It's just if we can get that gradient higher, up to 25 or 30 millimeters, we can then enhance the return of blood to the right atria. Okay, so that's one of the things we have to overcome with veins. The other thing we have to overcome with the veins, especially in the systemic system, is gravity. Gravity is working against us. So we have to somehow try to overcome gravitational forces that want to hold the blood towards our feet and towards our extremities. Okay, so one of the things we have to do with veins is we make those valves. And those valves are going to help us with... Um, creating a way to somewhat prevent the fluid from constantly falling back into the um, extremities and into the lower regions of our fingers and our feet. The third issue that we have to overcome in the veins is they don't have all that elastic tissue. They don't have all the smooth muscles. They're not as thick. And they are lumen-wise thinner, and they can kind of collapse and everything. So the veins have a lot of what's known as capacitance. They can hold a large amount of blood volume um, compared to arteries at any given time, all right? And so part of the reason why veins look the way they do, part of the reason why veins uh, have some issues with returning blood to the heart are because of factors in their control and outside of their control, okay? So how do veins somewhat compensate? The backflow valves are going to help with getting pressure building up because you can kind of get more fluid in a part of the tube, and that will increase a little bit of pressure. They're also going to help with trying to overcome some of the forces of gravity, right, or to prevent gravity from pulling down. But valves can get damaged, and if valves get damaged, we can end up with um, varicose veins or spider veins because, again, uh, the, what do you call it, the backflow valve is not keeping the blood pooling um, or from pooling into that segment of the vein. All right, the va veins, again, are not very mu muscular, but luckily we have a whole skeletal muscle system that we can utilize um, to be able to help push on valves, help push on the vessels, and help generate some pressure, increased pressure in the venous system. So our skeletal muscle system is one of the ways we can try to overcome the veins not having a pump and not having uh, a pressure building system um, in them. And so what we see is anytime we keep moving our skeletal muscles and engaging muscle contractions, that will help to squeeze the blood towards the heart by building pressure, and then it helps squeeze the blood to the next maybe valve that then prevents it from falling around, okay? And we see that, you know, people get paralyzed and their skeletal muscles don't contract. And while you can kind of survive without this, and we even know that it, you can lock your knees out and somewhat prevent the little tiny muscle tone and contractions that are constantly going on. Um, and all of those things are important to help get blood back to your legs, but we can't survive without it, right? And even when we lie down, um, the valves and some of our muscle pump doesn't necessarily have to play as big of a role because gravity becomes a little bit less of a factor in that situation. All right. And then the third thing that is utilized to help us get blood back to the, um, to the heart is going to be breathing. Okay. So breathing works with creating some pressure gradients. And what happens is, and I don't know if I have my slide here, um, yeah, here it is. Uh, when, we, when we inhale, our entire thoracic cage is going to increase in volume. And when it increases in volume, we know that intrathoracic pressure in the chest, in the area around the heart and around the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava and some of our subclavians and different of these bigger uh, vessels are going to also be exposed to this lower pressure around them. And because it's lower pressure around them, we're going to see that there's now higher pressure in some of the other regions and outside regions of the chest wall and the body, and that's going to help create a high pressure in the extremities coming towards the low pressure in the chest, and it's going to suction up a little bit of that blood towards the right heart. So 
holding your breath and not seeing pressure changes in the chest wall could then be a detriment um, to your ability to return blood to the heart. And you see that with fighter pilots. One of the things they have to do when they're overcoming nine times the force of gravity in a 9G environment is they have to have little quick air exchanges, little bit of changes in pressure that allow venous return to occur. And so they can get blood into the heart to then pump it out for the next beat. Okay, and again, this is just showing you the right atrium, when it's empty, it, it helps because it's zero millimeters of pressure, and then as it starts to fill with blood, again, it's not exerting any contractile force, but just fluid uh, being put into a cylinder, into a chamber, is going to have a little bit more pressure than no fluid in that chamber, and so we see it come up. But even so, with the help of skeletal muscle pump, with the help of backflow valves, and with the help of the thoracic pressure changes, we can get to about 25 millimeters of pressure in our our venules, and that will then help to bring blood back to the heart. Okay. All right. I think I need to go back a few slides. So, do, 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 oh, I went too far back. Okay. All right. So let's go back and talk about these veins and their capacitance. Veins can expand very easily, and because veins have such high capacitance, ability to accommodate large amounts of blood volume, most of our blood volume in our body actually sits in our vein, uh, in our systemic veins. All right. So. What this does is it provides us a few different things. It tells us that large portions of our four to six liters of blood volume is actually sitting in the deoxygenated, non-useful side of our body. But if we can get more systemic contraction, all right, so venoconstriction, venoconstriction through maybe more skeletal muscle contractions or uh, other types of signaling molecules to cause these larger vessels to contract, we actually have an ability to maybe bring in more EDV, return venous return to the heart a little bit higher, all right? Uh, the other thing is some of our venous systems are actually like the liver, the bone marrow, some big network in the skin, the spleen. They're these big organs that have all those sinusoidal type capillaries. And so those delicate organs, um, if we can increase or and constrict and get more of the blood out of them, we have a huge venous reserve. Okay, so in times of distress, in times where, and that's what this, these two slides are basically talking about, when there's a potential of we've lost a significant amount of blood, we're not potentially going to die right away as long as we didn't, we lose a percentage that we can replace by increasing venous return and dipping into this venous reserve that's sitting in your liver, sitting in your spleen, sitting in your skin, sitting in some of your um, your bigger venous blood vessels. Okay, and so by this allows us a little bit of I can lose a pint, maybe two pints of blood, no problem. I have venous reserve to compensate, um, but it's a slippery slope. If we continue to lose more blood because we lost an arm, we're not staunching the bleeding, or we have an aneurysm, or whatever, uh, eventually it's a, it's a losing battle. So you, if you lose too, too much blood and the venous reserve can't overcome, and you really don't have enough oxygen being carried because you've lost that much amount of your red blood cells, then you would be up a creek and probably dead. Okay. So again, the venous valves are important along with the skeletal muscle pump to help create a way to build pressure to help get blood flow back towards the heart and also to prevent it from falling down. Any damage, any issues that occur or lack of skeletal muscle, again, paralyzed people, they don't have the skeletal muscle pump working, so the valves still work when they're in an upright position, but they have to do... Um, Physically, somebody has to either move their legs around a lot, or they, if they have the ability to move their arms and move their legs, they, they try to some extent to do that. And then they can spend more time in a supine position where gravity can kind of be taken out. Okay? And then we've already kind of talked about our respiratory pump. So at this point, this is the big first part of the chapter. And it, it's, it's just the big physiological and anatomical features of why vessels are what they are, where the blood is going to be in those vessels, and that vessels can be damaged and that can cause problems, as well as vessels can be remodeled to try to compensate for their insufficient ability to bring oxygen to downstream tissue. Okay? 
Now comes the hard part. All right. You have a supply and demand problem. You have a certain amount of fluid in your body at any given time, four to six liters. Of that four to six liters, you are pumping five liters of the blood a minute. Okay, so you should be moving about one, your entire blood volume once a minute. But that entire blood volume at any given time is probably not enough blood to feed every single capillary bed to the maximal extent. So what you have to do is you have to set up a system where you can distribute the blood where it's most needed at any given point in time, knowing that your flow stays pretty consistent uh, and while it can increase, you know, in some extremes, but for the most part, your flow is staying consistent, so you have to balance where it's going and different vessels that are characterized because of where it's going and where it's coming back to, okay? So some of the things about the demand and the supply are the vessels are not going to be the same. They're not the same shape. They're not the same size across the board. Capillaries are different from arterials. Arterials are different from muscular arteries, and muscular arteries are different from elastic arteries. And so because they're not the same diameter, because there's not the same number, we're going to see that the flow velocity through vessels is going to be different. We're going to see that vessels re produce different resistances to be overcome. And because of the different resistance and the different size and the different amount and the different length, we're going to see that there are different pressures associated with the vessels. And that's what this is basically trying to show you. Okay? All right. So to talk about all of this physics, we have to talk about, again, more of the distinguishing features within the vasculature. Okay? And some of the distinguishing features in the vascular relate to their physical dimensions. Okay? So one of the things about arteries, systemic arteries, is they are thicker. So one of the things we're going to see is as we look at elastic, muscular, arterioles to capillaries versus the veins, all right, the thickness of the walls is going to be different. And because the thickness of the walls is different and the elastic recoil tissue amount and the, and the makeup of the elastic wall or the walls, we are going to see that there is a different diameter associated with different areas of the vasculature. Okay. So that's where the physical dimensions and the morphological characteristics are going to differ, okay? And then if you multiply out the, the number of vessels times what diameter they have, we see that uh, the cross-sectional area that a vessel is feeding and has available for blood to flow in is going to be different throughout the system. So you have one aorta. It's a on average, around 2.5 centimeters. So its total cross-sectional area is around 4.5 centimeters squared. Okay. When we get to our muscular arteries, so our bigger arteries, there are 160 of them. And on average, their diameter is smaller than the aorta because, again, they're branching off, so they're going to get smaller. And the total cross-sectional area, so if this is, let's say, a um, the size of a, I don't know, the size of a uh, desk. Because we have 160 of these at 4 centimeters, the amount of space the blood is occupying was a desk in the aorta. Now, let's say it's the size of the room. So it's the total cross-sectional area of what a classroom is going to be. And then when you get to arterioles, you're getting to 5 times 10 to the 7th power, each one being 30 microns. Now we're getting to the total cross-sectional area of a building. And then when you get to all the capillaries and you're at 10 to the 10th power, now you have, with even though it's 5 microns, our cross-sectional area might be the entire cross-sectional area of the city block or the campus. Okay. And so because of those physical dimensions and characteristics, uh, the velocity of the blood flowing through these vessels, the resistance that is provided by the vessels to blood flow is going to constantly be different. And then as we work our way back up to the venous side, back to the heart, we're going to see even the differences. They, they don't match up. They're not mirror imaged. And so we're going to continue to see 
differences in cross-sectional area, differences in flow, differences in pressure, and differences in resistance. And all of that is going to then influence total body, what is our pressure that we have to produce per beat of the heart at any given second, and what is the pressure we need to have pushing on each vessel at different segments, and what is the resistance, and what is then the blood flow coming from the heart, and what is the blood flow going into a capillary bed. And it all interlinks together. All right, so this is our flow equation. All right, Q stands for flow, and for the most part, uh, flow is your cardiac output. It's your stroke volume. It is the amount of blood that is being put out of the heart and into the vessels at any given time, okay? Now, the pressure is always going to be a, a gradient, all right? So absolute pressure of what is it absolutely is not important as what is the gradient. What is the difference from the pressure at one end of the vessel versus what is it at the end um, of the at the end of the vessel? So from the beginning to the end. Okay. All right. So Q is normally it's a proportional signal. Is is proportional to the changes in pressure. So the pressure at the initial part of the vessel to the end or the at the at the the opening or the end of the vessel, right? And we see larger changes in pressure from initial part to end point where we encounter the most resistance. And the most resistance is normally going to be um, related to the diameter of the vessel, okay? So let's go back just one slide, all right? Where we're going to see most of our resistance is going to be where we're going to have um, the greater changes in pressure, right? So know that every second you're putting out five liters of fluid per minute. So in the aorta, you have five liters of blood flowing through the aorta through the 2.5 centimeters through the 4.5 centimeters every given minute. And then that fluid goes into 20 square centimeters into 160 vessels with a smaller diameter, all right? And then we see the arterioles, they go even to a smaller diameter, all right? But there's more of them. So what we see is as the cross-sectional area, we're going to see the vo velocity change. The flow is not changing, but its ability to flow at a certain speed will change. And we're going to see the pressure gradient and the resistance are also going to change because of the changes in diameter, changes in the elastic recoil, and some of those factors that are due to the morphological characteristics. Okay. So let's apply it to this little picture. Okay. All right. Flow. Flow is five liters a minute, let's say, and it is being held constant, right? The five liters a minute is going to flow into this vessel and out of this vessel, and it's not going to change. But this vessel is divided into three segments, and one of the things if you measure, segment C to D is the same as segment B to C in length. And segment A to B is the same as segment B to C and C to D. So lengths, they're all the same. So you can basically assume the length is going to be the same. Right? The blood flowing through is going to be the same viscosity through the three layers. Gravity is going to be the same across the board because we're not changing gravity. So three factors in this scenario are being held constant. Length of each segment, gravity, and blood viscosity. And even though those three factors are being held constant, we still have a lot to talk about, right? The resistance across the point A to point D is going to be a function, and that's what the resistance total, it's a function of what is the resistance in segment one versus what is the resistance in segment two versus what is the resistance in segment three. Right? So the resistance, because this is a series, is going to be the total resistance equal to the sum of the resistance at each little segment. Okay? All right. When we look at resistance one, resistance one has a certain diameter. And that certain diameter is going to have a little bit of a restriction to the flow of blood from the initial start at point PA to what is at PB, OK? 
Okay? So what we see is because of the resistance that is in this segment from A to B, with a flow that is being held constant, we see the pressure at PA to the pressure at PB is going to be a change in pressure across this little segment. All right, Christy, you have a question? Welcome to the class. Are you following a little bit with me? OK, you're just here. Welcome. OK. All right. So that is basically, if we're looking at the flow equation, and we're looking at what's going on just from segment A to B, we see that flow at 5 liters a minute is flowing across the resistance based on the diameter of this segment. And because of the diameter and because the flow is constant, we're going to see a pressure change from what is the pressure at point A to what is the pressure at point B. And you see that it changes and it did drop a little bit. And that change in pressure is equal to that constant flow times the resistance of that part of the vessel. Okay. When we look at the next one, the resistance here is different from what it is in R1. And the reason why it's different is the diameter of the vessel is different. The length is still the same. The blood has not changed. The flow has not changed. Gravity hasn't changed. But our diameter has decreased. And so because our diameter has decreased, we see that pressure coming in at this point is going to undergo a more significant change at the end of the C segment. And we see that the more significant pressure change over this increase in resistance, all right, more robust resistance of resistance 2, generates a greater delta P. And then our last segment, we see we have the largest diameter. And so we have possibly, in comparison to the other two little segments, the least amount of resistance in this segment. And so we see that the change in pressure with the constant flow, and again, all those other factors holding steady, is the least amount. Right? So what C is trying to tell us all right, is when we look at our system and we think of our system as here's an artery, here's an arterial, and maybe here's a capillary, right? When we look at the system, the system is set up somewhat to serial resistance, adding them together. And when we look at the differences in the radius, which is mainly how the resistance is being determined in our vessels, wherever we have the most resistance, so the smallest radius, and the most constriction occurring and the most resistance to blood flow, all right, we are going to see the greatest changes in pressure from the start of that vessel to the end of that vessel. And that's the takeaway message, is larger pressure changes. There's large pressure drops where resistance is the highest. Okay. All right, and I'm going to leave you right here with this because before I go into the specifics of um, vascular resistance, total peripheral resistance, fluid dynamics, I want you to reread uh, that part of the chapter. And so chapter 21, we're going to start with 21-2. We're going to head into the specifics of uh, blood pressure regulation and capillary pressure and venous return and net filtration pressure. We're going to do that next week. Okay? And this stuff is hard, what I just went through. So the flow equation is your goal. Get to where you understand a little bit of the physics behind this flow equation, and then we can start adding into the specifics of our cardiovascular system to why the arterioles are going to be our greatest resistance areas, therefore see the greatest changes in resistance, why the flow velocity is going to change with resistance, with diameters, and the, the complications of all of that. Okay, Christy, do you have any questions? I know you got in here only like two minutes ago, um, but any questions from you before we call it a day? Alrighty, so lab on Thursday, come ready to look at arteries, so turn towards the back of um, chapter 21. Again, you want to be able to start with um, learning your arteries this week, 
And that should start around da, 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 what page? Um, 754, 755, somewhere in there, starting to learn your, your branches off the aorta and then how the blood eventually makes its way to the brain and to the, all the major organs. And then the following week, we'll do veins. All right, that's all I got. So I will see you guys Thursday in class. And I will hope to see you with questions. And we can continue to maybe talk a little bit more in person on vascular function and vascular changes. Okay, have a good day.